the, uh, the topic tonight is um, Reform, Conservative, and, and Orthodox Theology and Ideology. And someday Sarah said to me, oh, you know, I may choose to be something, you know, I may choose to be you know, something that I'm currently not. Or something. I said, what's fascinating about, I think, this, this topic is that many of us are going to find that we fall into a category that we never thought applied to us. Um, and I also want to uh, give you a little bit of my, my own background. I grew up uh, conservative in America, which meant that my family belonged to a conservative synagogue. It didn't mean that my lifestyle reflected conservative Judaism. I didn't even know what that meant. Um, it's funny because uh, you, and you'll hear people say, I belong to an Orthodox synagogue, but I'm not Orthodox. Or you hear people say, I belong, you know, I'm Reformed. I didn't do anything growing up. People say, I'm conservative. Why are you conservative, at least in North America? I'm conservative because that's the synagogue we belong to. Um, I am, equal, although I'm a conservative, uh, uh, I'm not actually from the conservative movement, um, and I, uh, my, my rabbi gig is on at Grown Street, uh, the conservative center there, there's a big Knesset, and that's where I do my thing. Uh, I'm not a, uh, I don't wave the flag of conservative Judaism. At all, I'm incredibly critical of conservative Judaism. I'm also critical. I, I see, I've seen really wonderful things in conservative Judaism. I'm equally critical and see wonderful things in Orthodoxy and in Reform Judaism. So uh, I, I certainly come to this with my own biases, um, but I'm an equal you know, opportunity critic uh, and embracer. <clears throat> Before we can uh, address the idea of the theology and the I ideology of the movements. I want to talk about uh, the origin, or how did there, how, how did within Judaism there sprouted um, variations? Um, and the truth is, is that before the, uh, the emancipation, political emancipation in Europe, and the Enlightenment, which was an intellectual enlightenment in Europe, uh, Jews were part of the Jewish community, the Jewish world, and there was always a varying uh, degree of uh, of observance up until that time. Uh, in the public sphere, people tended to be more homogeneous, but in the private sphere, less so. Meaning, a community had people, you know, their community went to, sh went to show on Shabbat morning, but people did in their own homes was a different story. But there was a more cohesiveness in the Jewish world, although there were still variations of how Judaism was done. The greatest example is to see, you know, see the, the practices of the Ashkenazi world against the Sephardi world. And there, there's pretty radical differences in the way Judaism was done uh, along those lines. Um, but it also, from shtetl to shtetl, there were differences. And it really depended on whoever the Rav was in that community, who he was a disciple of, who his Rav was. And those are how definitions uh, took place. Baruch Spinoza, who was in the 16th century, was 16th and 17th century, he was uh, considered very radical. Uh, he came out, and although he was an observant Jew, he questioned the origin of the Torah. And traditionally, the origin of the Torah, uh, our, our, our Masoret tells us, our tradition tells us, that it was given, the five books of Moses were given to Moses from God in Mount Sinai, and if there's going to be any equivocating, it was either written by God, with God's finger, and given to Moses in the form of, of, the, of the sacred Torah, or it was, it was given to Moshe, and Moshe wrote it down word for word. And that's the discrepancy, perhaps, within traditional theological approach to the origin of the Torah. Um, but Spinoza kind of came out and said, you know, what if, you know, what if there's some human authorship uh, in, our, in the Tanakh? And he was put in a harem, and he was kind of kicked out of the community. And for a Jew living in Europe to be thrown out of the ghetto or thrown out of the shtetl, it was it was precarious. Not just you not have a, you no longer had a community, but it was life threatening. One of the reasons why Jews congregated the way they did was for the purposes of their own survival, because of anti-Semitism, because there wasn't the opportunity to assimilate, because there was real. Uh, danger for a Jew outside his com or her community. What happened in the 1800s? What happened in the 1800s were was the these two elements that, that kind of hit around the same time: the intellectual enlightenment 
<coughs> and the emancipation. The emancipation um, was this idea that Jews could receive citizenship in the country where they were living. Until that time, a Jew was seen as a parasite, or a, a Jew was in a was in uh, in, a, in the host country as a guest of the country. But a Jew wasn't a German, or a Jew wasn't French. It was a Jew living in Germany or a Jew living in France. With the emancipation, political uh, political uh, protection was given to Jews who became citizens of the state. So now no longer do they have to necessarily rely on the small Jewish enclave to protect them from the outside non-Jewish non world, but there was now uh, their citizenship in, their, in the country where they resided that could protect them. At the same time, <coughs> along with this new liberation of citizenship came uh, a liberation of ideas in something called the Haskalah, or the Enlightenment, where being able to leave the small confines of the ghetto, or the walls of the Jewish community, and interact with the greater world, you, Jews started going to universities. Jews started being exposed to different philosophy. Jews started being exposed to um, different types of scholarship. And what happened was exposure to that new kind of scholarship caused certain caused Jews who were skeptics or questioning in the first place to think perhaps the origin of the Torah is different than what we've always been told. Perhaps rather than believing that every word of the Chumash was given literally from God to Moshe, perhaps the contradictions that we see in the Sefer Torah, perhaps the, 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 uh, the misspellings of words, perhaps the different girso, the, the, the different versions of the, of, the, um, of the text that we have, perhaps there's due to either some kind of human or scribal error, or perhaps there's human influence on the actual content. And the earliest, the earliest uh, Jews who adopted that idea were, were in Germany, which was the most enlightened society at its time. And they were the early reformers. The origins of Reform Judaism is the result of Jews who now no longer have to live and dress a certain way to be part of the Jewish community, but want to start assimilating a little bit. Not necessarily not being Jewish, but why not dress like the greater society? <clears throat> why not build our, our synagogues like the churches, the beautiful churches? Why do ours have to be you know, these little decrepit little buildings? Why not speak in the vernacular? Why do we have to speak Yiddish? Why not speak the language of our host country? to show that we are also German, okay, we're Jews and we're German, we're Jews and we're French. So these early reformers adopted a, a critical way of looking at the text, which became, came to be known as biblical criticism, where you look at the, you look at the, uh, at the text as in a narrative form, and you can see the, the different literary changes and styles of the, of the language of the Torah, and you can start to see that perhaps they're, they could be uh, broken into different segments and possibly agendaized. <clears throat> uh, because this was also happening, by the way, uh, with the church. Uh, a, a greater critique of, of church teachings. By the way, the church, interestingly, the church, the church fathers did not want a, li uh, a literate public. The church fathers wanted <clears throat> Christians to remain illiterate Which and rely church? on the church. Pardon? Which church? Catholic, well, first, Catholic. first was the Catholic Church. Well, there was only the Catholic Church originally, and, and there was, and they, they, and the Protestant Reformation was actually a reaction to yes. uh, the uh, to the Catholic Church not wanting to be literate, and then you know couldn't learn Bible and all that sort of stuff. So, so, whereas Judaism always emphasized at least the males being literate knowing how to read and write and learn and create Kiddushin. Whereas the church fathers, the church leaders, wanted its adherents to depend and rely on them to tell them what is church doctrine rather than read it themselves and, and think for themselves. Judaism always, 
always impressed upon us that we should be learning to be able to have access to the text ourselves. Was uh, that learning that was purely in Hebrew? That wasn't it wasn't in the vernacular. The well, lingua de Kodesh, meaning the uh, the texts were the original texts that we have today, the Chumash, yes. the Gemara. Yes. <coughs> However, the actual what language they did the they they, they did the the, uh, the discussion in, I don't know. Maybe Yiddish. It could have yeah, been the Yiddish would, would use the Hebrew script. Oh sure, the script, the script. No, 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 they didn't use translations of our. They didn't use translations. But did they use the vernacular script, the, the civil writing, their education, or they were educated? You say that the Christians were educated. You're asking about the, the Jews. The Jews were literate, but they were literate only in the Hebrew language. Ah, or the it. Yes, but what? No, but what? Yes. Well, I can't answer that because I'm not a historian. Yeah. But they were certainly literate in the Hebrew alphabet yeah, okay. and be able to read to read and understand that. Yeah. Um, were they literate, if they were Russian Jews, were they able to read and write uh, Russian? I don't know. I don't know. So, one of the influences on the early Reformed Jews was the Reformation happening in the church itself. So, Reformed Jews, they adopted this idea that you could look at the, look at the text, the Jewish text, the original Jewish text, in a, in a radically different way than was permitted before. Reform, the, the early reformers wanted to break out of this idea that the Jew was something other than a Frenchman or other than a German and be, be fully German but Jewish. Be fully French but Jewish. Be American. There wasn't American then, but yeah. like an American, but Jewish was who they were in religion, but American was who they were in nation nationality. <clears throat> so that was the early, the early reformers. In response to that, and by the way, there was no title orthodox before then. Right. It was Jew. Reforms created. Right. There was Jew, okay? And, and different communities of Jews did things a little bit differently. And there was always, you know, Rabbanim from one, from one area of being critical of Rabbanim from the other area, particularly the Hasidim and the uh, Minasti and the Mis Misnagdim, <coughs> uh, which were the Lithuanian school of thought, which is a rigorous Torah scholarship versus the Hasidim, who kind of wanted to make it a more user-friendly type way of, of doing Jewish. And there was a terrible, a terrible fight between the two. But... Other than that, there, was, there wasn't orthodoxy and something else. There was just Jews who did things uh, differently. In response to the early reformers, there was a, uh, a backlash from the traditionalists in the Jewish world, and they started defining Judaism that was really authentic and traditionally acceptable in terms of what in, in, a, in opposition to what was happening in the reform world. So, they, so, so their response was, you only give divrei Torah in Yiddish or perhaps Hebrew. You do not, you don't, we never speak in the vernacular in a Beit Knesset. You would only dress a certain way. Your synagogue has to be you know, a certain height. It can't be, it can't be uh, one of these large cathedral type, type places. Um, you... Uh, you, the, the laws of how you interact with a non-Jew were, were, which, which become lenient during the Middle Ages now became a little more severe for that community. <clears throat> and then there was a population that appreciated the intellectual curiosity of what Reform Judaism was doing by questioning the origin of the texts, but did not like the way reform ideology had kind of abandoned ritual observance. Okay, what happened with, with the early reformers is that basically the early reformers got to the point where they said the, the mitzvot, there's two categories of, of mitzvot. There's ben adam lechavero, between humans, and ben adam lemakom, between humans and God. What are humans and God? Shabbat, kashrut, tefillin, tefillah, hadlakat neirot. Ben Adam Mechavero is ethical business practices. Not to steal, not to lie, not to commit adultery, pay your wage, pay your laborer, giving tzedakah. Those are Ben Adam Mechavero. The, the, the reformers said, okay, 
the Benadam Le Macon, the ritual elements, that was for a specific time that it was necessary to create a Jewish people, the Am. But now, no longer are, is the Benadam Le, Le Macon, I mean, Benadam Le Macon, are those, no, that's no longer uh, obligatory on the Jew. What's obligatory on the Jew is between each other, how you treat the other. Because they started questioning if the origin of the Torah is not God telling you, you must keep the Sabbath in this way. And, and traditionally we'll say the, the 39 categories of forbidden, uh, for, forbidden work for, for Torah, we want to say, is it, go, it goes back to Moses, uh, the tradition says it goes back to Moses, and Moses passed on, passed on orally. If we start to question that and say, you know what, it was really humans interpreting or developing Judaism the way they thought it was appropriate for the early part of the first millennium, then here we are toward the, you know, 1700 years later, and it, and it doesn't speak to us in the same way. So, so basically you're saying, because they first made the decision that the Torah is not divine, they eventually end up excising God from it's the It's not that they said the Torah is not divine. They got rid of, all, they got rid of the all, of the, the, they, all of the things that relate to God. They basically <coughs> excised no. God from the religion. No, because, because no, and what, we're going to get to what the ideologies and the theologies are <coughs> in, uh, very soon. But Reform Judaism didn't say it's not divine. What Reform Judaism would say is, is, is it was a people that were inspired by a belief in God. And that inspiration and that desire to be in connection with God makes, makes our practices divine. That whether or not we know that God specifically said, you shall do X, Y, or Z, the fact that we believe that that's what God expects of us makes those practices divine. Okay? So they, they don't want to take God out of it. And they don't want to say that, they don't want to say that God... Uh, Either neither the guy that God doesn't exist or that God doesn't care. They're not saying that at all. They're just saying that that historically, if you look at the document, if you look at the uh, the text, you can very well see the influence of humans, both what's happening inside the Jewish world, and outside the Jewish world, on the development of, of Judaism, and that should continue. But you just said that all the commandments that related to man and God, they said weren't obligatory. No, what I said was that the ritual elements that were about about humans and God were no longer obligatory because, and what they said is, the idea of sacrifices or the idea of the times for prayer or the idea of what you do or don't do on Shabbat, those were necessary for a certain period of time in history to create the sense of nationality for the Jewish people. But those, those, those have served their purpose and those are no longer what speaks to that generation, our generation now, and no longer is it necessary. And so those are no longer obligatory. Mm -hmm. But we do believe that it's still, we're still obliged and, and uh, obligated to follow the mitzvot and how we're supposed to treat each other. Because the relationship between humans has, has maintained. God is not in the world the way God's, what God's presence once was in the world, not interacting the same way, and our, our actions can reflect the difference. I want to hold. I want to hold the questions just because I've been asked to kind of hold the questions until the end. I'm sorry, but um, all right, sorry. because I know the the question, and I may actually touch on some of the things that you're that you're about to ask. Um, is that right, Yona? I just that we you know, edit that part out. <laughs> and if I want to make sure, I have to. I just be really uh, sorry, religious. Um, Okay, so there was this population who intellectually felt that, that the move to being a little more critical of the origin of the text made sense, but did not like the idea of abandoning this idea of ritual observance. Those were the early conservatives. Conservatives, conserve, to conserve means to preserve. So conservative Judaism wasn't, had nothing to do with a political perspective had everything with trying to conserve Jewish practice at the same time as you allow your mind and your intellect to deal with with modern uh, scholarship and let's say modern enlightenment enlightenment so that was the origin of the three movements okay now I'm going to be painting a pretty broad picture when I when I pass out this chart of 
what is ideology of the ideology of the three movements, and what is the theology of the three movements. Again, within orthodoxy, there is a large spectrum. Within conservative Judaism, there is a large spectrum, and, reform, and within reform Judaism, there's a large spectrum. But this is very accurate description or depiction of what normative positions, what the normative positions are in all three of the movements. The fourth movement, which is Reconstructionism, is also found on this page, but we are not going to uh, we're not going to address that. For the, the biggest reason, the two biggest reasons we're not going to address that is number one is Reconstructionist Judaism has not yet become a major player on the scene. But number two is that Reconstructionist Judaism is really hard to define even for those who are who define themselves Reconstructionist. as Reconstructionists. <laughs> and so I would not do a, I would not do do justice to try to to try to explain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mark Bashi did. Now it's going to be very hard for you not to. Uh, it's going to be hard, very hard for you to resist not jumping and looking looking through the uh, the sources, your, I mean the uh, the writings yourself. Um, so perhaps I'll give you a minute. Yeah, let me pass it around. I will tell you now, I don't fall into one of the, I don't fall into anything that's on one of these things on the sheet. At the end, I'll be happy to tell you where I fall in terms of the theology and ideology if it isn't if it doesn't come out. But so just because you don't find yourself somewhere on the page doesn't mean that you really weren't born to a Jewish mother or that you're not an Israeli citizen or that you didn't go through a valid conversion. Okay? Or that your pursuit of being a Jew one day um, is, is hopeless because you aren't here. Okay, we're going to start with, um, with orthodoxy. Now when I speak about theology, I'm specifically speaking here about your belief in the origin of the law. There's, there's two types of law. There's the oral law, which is the Tanakh, which is the Chumash and the Book of Prophets and the rest of the writings. And there's the oral law, which for our purposes means the, the mission and the Gemara together which create the Talmud. Okay? Now, just to define things for us, I don't want to assume anything. An example of the written law is it says you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. That's the written law. The oral law tells us how, does it, how do Jews understand that? What does that mean? And the oral law is what's brought us to the point where we say, okay, we don't, we don't consume milk and meat together in the same meal. We don't cook them together. We don't sell them together. We wait a certain number of hours between them. We use different dishes. That's the oral law. So the written law, quite truthfully, isn't enough to tell you how to live, how to live a Jewish life. The written law will say, you must follow the Sabbath. The oral law comes in and defines what is the Sabbath and how does one follow it. Okay? So in Orthodoxy, the theology is, the written the oral Torah, were written by God to Moses at Mount Sinai. Now this is the, 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 public, the public position of Orthodoxy is, the Torah that we have today, both the written law and the oral law, was all given to Moses. The physical Torah, the written law, was passed down from generation to generation. It's immutable, meaning it's perfect, it's unchangeable. And the written and the oral law as well. So God told Moses, what does it mean, don't boil the kid in its mother's milk? And then Moses passed it down orally to Joshua, who passed it down to the judges, who passed it down to the prophets, who passed it down to the people of the great assembly, etc., etc. Okay? Now, we'll leave that for a moment. Okay, so in orthodoxy, even in modern orthodoxy, this is what is the, on the record, or in the public sphere, that is the theology that comes with orthodoxy. It doesn't mean every orthodox Jew believes that. It just means that this is what they're going to be, the, the rabbis or the teachers, or what you're going to see in writing, or, or in words, in the public sphere, this is going to be what's going to be taught, or claimed. Okay? So what kind of ideology comes with that? Now, an ideology, and the, I'm speaking ideolo ideology here, means 
What, how does that mean that Judaism, where, where is the room for Judaism to grow or, st or, or should stay where it is? Or what does that mean in terms of how does, how does that movement's, uh, what's that movement's perspective on where Judaism, the, the latitude that Judaism has toward being flexible or, or adapting or changing, if at all? So the ideology of orthodoxy would be, all the Torah is the word of God. As such, Jewish law is, is the absolute word of God, and there is little change in the law. The law is binding and obligatory on all the Jewish people. Okay, so the fact that it says um, in the Torah, um, here's an example. Um, okay, so the Torah itself doesn't say that you must have a quorum of ten adult Jews in order to do, do something in public, in order to read the Torah in public. It doesn't say that in the Torah anywhere. Okay? We learn from it in the oral law. In the oral law, it says, it uses uh, various uh, her hermeneutic principles, which are the principles that, that we use, to, that the, the Chazal used to analyze the, the text. And they came up with the idea that there must be 10 adults, uh, 10 adult Jews present to do something, divrei uh, b'shivik dusha, to say Kaddish, to read the Torah, to do Shabbat Rachot for a wedding, etc. Ten adult Jews? Males? Ten, ten, oh, no, no, no. ten, ten adult oh. Jews. The Gemara also says that women are obligated for tefillah. The Mishnah says this, that women are obligated for tefillah, that women may have, uh, have an aliyah of the Torah. Okay? Now, the Gemara specifically says a woman may have an aliyah of the Torah, but she doesn't have knowledge of the Torah, mipnei kabod tzibor, because of the reasons of the honor of the community. Okay, so <clears throat> the law was determined that it had to be ten adult males. So for kabod tzibor, for kabod tzibor. So that means that it wasn't. <laughs> And that seems for a woman to be able to do something that a man should be able to do. Well, the, well, I don't, I don't want to get into. Yeah, we, we can, we can, we can address that issue if you'd like in a moment, I, in a little bit. But I just want to say that. So that's what traditional Judaism would say. Now we have to understand something. Two thousand years ago, a woman was defined by the man in her life. Either her father, or her husband, or if there was one of those two missing, her brother or an uncle. That's how she was defined. There, there wasn't working outside the household for a woman. There wasn't education the way we know it today for a woman. Okay? But the idea is, that's how the law was understood 2,000 years ago. The fact that today, a woman's a definition of, of who a woman is may be very, very different than it was 2,000 years ago, doesn't change anything for orthodoxy. Because it's the absolute word of God. It's immutable. The, Torah, the rabbis of the Gemara were not creating or developing Jewish law. They were just uncovering God's law. And so God's law is a woman does not have an out of the Torah. Because it could be an embarrassment to the, to the, to the public in some way. And just, so, so even though a woman's status may be very different today in the secular world, the law is the law. And there's no changing that law. Despite the fact that there may be plenty of precedent, both historical precedent and textual precedent for it, that's not how the law was decided 2,000 years ago. It was decided as X, and X remains the law. Because X, God's law doesn't change. It is forever. What does it mean? Pardon? What does it mean it could be an So, so the, the typical understanding is that to have a woman book for Naliyah of the Torah means that she's literate, she, she can read, and it means that there isn't a man, that, that somehow by having a woman do it, it means that there, isn't a, there aren't enough men capable of doing it themselves. So it would embarrass the men of the community. Okay? But why would it embarrass, I'm sorry to ask questions when I told you not to ask that question. <laughs> 
Why would it? Only, only let certain people ask the questions. That's why. Gotcha. Who are the people who are asking? Not you. The rich. Questions throughout. You ask a question. First of all, the. Um, it isn't embarrassing if you know that there are many um, men in the community who can and do lead. Okay, so that's a different yeah, discussion. We, yes, yeah, we, that is certainly we we can you know I'd love to come back and, and, and we'll do this we can do a session on the role of women in, in the observant Jewish world. Okay, so we can certainly have a conversation. But I'm just using that as the example of how the ideology that comes with the theology that that God's law is absolute and immutable means that there isn't a lot of room for change. What, what I'm saying is that I believe that there are shuls even in this city. Who, uh, that are orthodox, considered orthodox, or call themselves orthodox, and are changing things. And that you've got orthodox women who have... Right, right. Sorry, next sorry. Next week, next week. If it's my answer, my mind is going to ask you yeah, about the question. Let's ask Nadia. Let's ask Nadia. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's, we're going to move on to the conservative... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, no, this, this is something that's really troubling me. You're saying that the oral law was, in fact, created by the rabbis, right? No, what I'm, what, well, what I'm saying is that our tradition, the orthodox position of the oral law, is that it was passed down orally from God to Moses and passed down even to the point of the rabbis. Mm -hmm. And that, yes, that the rabbis were simply discussing the oral law that they received from the generation before them. See, the oral law, it was, it was forbidden to write the oral law on paper. That was a law. For a time. It was forbidden to write the oral law on paper. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, in the 200 of the Common Era, took a very drastic measure. He saw the oral law being so expansive, because they continue to discuss it, so being, so, saw it being so expansive, and so few people that could actually remember it all, that he took it into his own hands to write it down in the form of the Mishnah, okay? And then, once he did that, then there was then a record of the rabbi's discussion about what's going on in the Mishnah. For example, it may say in the Torah, the, you know, don't boil the cap in its mother's milk. The Mishnah may say, okay, that means that you do not have milk and meat together at the same meal. Okay, but what does that mean? Does that mean, then the Gemara has to come in and say, that was the Mishnah. Yeah. Then the Gemara comes in and says, well, what does that mean? Does that mean you can't cook it in the same pot? Does that mean you have to have separate pots? Does that mean you have to wait between? Uh, you know, it, it, it was, there were these, all these different levels. And despite the fact that what the, one of the brilliant elements of the Gemara is that it preserves the different opinions. Even though the, the Halakha follows Rabbi Akiva, it has, the, it has the opinions of three other rabbis there. And they'll say that it's all Hashem Shemayim. These are all the words of the living God. Meaning that these, these, these rabbis, they believe, receded from their rabbis, who, who could fall at their, trace all the way back to, Mo, to Moses. And these people were, were so close to God in their spirit that God could actually speak through them somehow too. So despite the fact that we can, in our modern day eyes, look and say, oh, we've got four men here, each of different opinions, if God gave us the law, how is it possible that there are four different opinions on the same matter if God told Moses exactly what it meant? Okay? So, so orthodoxy would say, these are all the words of God, we know they're from God, and, and, and the fact that we see the argument on the page, and we see what the, what the, what the result is, it's just for us to, us to learn about what the argumentation was, but the law still remains X. Whereas a modernist may look and say, look, you can see, Rabbi Kiva holds this position, but uh, this other rabbi who came from a different part of the world has a different position because it talks about the different social milieu in which they grew up. So we, there's, there, there's some people who, who will look at, who will look at these texts with a enlightenment perspective. Enlightenment isn't really a nice word, but a, a different perspective, and say this, it's possible that there was a different influence. It wasn't just. Didn't just all come to Moses. I think you're simplifying, are you oversimplifying the orthodox position. Of course, if, I just, am. if you just take the story of, of, of Moses in Rabbi Akiva's uh, Beit Midrash, you know when he when he goes goes to the Beit Midrash and he doesn't understand what Rabbi Akiva's talking about, that's an orthodox position. Yet it's quite inconsistent with the simplistic way you describe. 
that, you know, if Moses heard it from Hashem, why didn't he know what Rabbi Akiva was talking about well, later? Okay. It's, 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 you're so, oversimplifying. So, of, of course I'm simplifying. Of course I'm simplifying. Yes, I'm, 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 absolutely, I'm absolutely simplifying it. But what was the purpose for that, for that, for that agada? The purpose of that agada was to answer people's questions by saying, did Moses really pass down all this stuff? And we're showing that Moses himself didn't even understand what was going on in Rabbi Akiva's yeshiva, but the fact that Rabbi Akiva was saying in the name of Moses, it calmed Moshe. It made him feel like, okay, the chain from, from me to this new teacher 2,000 years later, the fact that I'm still part of it, and they're, I'm, I'm comforted by that. But it didn't mean uh, it, 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 that Agata was there to address people's real questions of, did Moses, we really believe that Moses got all of this. And that was the response to it, which is, Moses, Moses never heard it before either, but it's being said in the name of Moses, so we can see that there's been a chain of great rabbanim from Moses to here that has preserved the kashrut, yes, yes, the kosherness yes. of, the, of the teaching. I think that's a much better way of describing it than the way you described it. Well, thank you. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for helping me get to the place I wanted to be. <laughs> okay. So now let's go. Now we're going to move to conservative, uh, the conservative theology. The written Torah was communicated to humanity by God through word and divine inspiration and penned by one Moshe or more persons, Nevi'im or even, even others. The oral law is a result of human partnership with God's written Torah to understand its religious message and the resulting code of Jewish law. Okay? So this is one that says that, it says that okay, God did not... We don't, don't necessarily believe that God wrote, this, wrote the Torah, but God communicated to Moses, and Moses put some of it on, on cloth, on, uh, what do they call it? Parchment. parchment, on parchment. It's also possible that the prophets who wrote, their, who wrote, who wrote what they did, you know, got prophecy from God, but they wrote it down. It was certainly written by them, so which allows them to bring their own kind of agenda. Like, when, I, when you hear me say thank you, you may hear me say thank you, you may, you may hear me say, you know, you know buzz off. Um, meaning that we all hear things a little differently. And the prophets who got Moses' word, perhaps they also, when they were giving over the prophecy, they also, came, they also gave, their, gave their, the prophecy they received was, was spoken in a way that went through their own filter. Or perhaps, perhaps, there was, this tri there was the, the priests, and the priests had a certain agenda a certain political and a certain religious agenda. And the whole book of Leviticus is about the Levites. The Levites, Levine, the Levites are the priests, right? And so they put in a lot of, uh, they made, perhaps they added many things themselves to make themselves important or to, for, for varying degrees, that's what they call the J, E, P, and D, which is biblical hypothesis, uh, which I am not a fan of personally, but but perhaps the Torah was all, the, the actual the written Torah wasn't only just the word of God, but it was also added on to that the word of man, the opinions of man, the understandings of man. Now, the, now that's the written law, the Tanakh. We get to the oral law, and the oral law is going to be, well, God blessed humans with intellect and wisdom and emotional intelligence and psychology and historical perspective, and analytical skills, and uh, whatever other things we can come up with. And we use those cabling that God gave us, and we use that on God's word, on, on the written law, to figure out how we're supposed to be, how's a Jew supposed to be in the world. Which means that even though it says, don't boil the cap in its mother's milk, we're using the cabling that God gave us to figure out what do we think God expects out of us. And the, and the written and the oral law, what you see in the Gemara, is the rabbis using those skills to argue back and forth what do we think God expects out of us, and to try to come up to some conclusion that could be consistent amongst all the Jews in the world. Okay? Now, what does that, and that moves us to the ideology. The written and the oral Torah are the result of human interaction and partnership with God. Jewish law is therefore evolving and organic and continues to develop. Jewish law is our understanding of God's will for how Jews are to live in the world. As such, the law is binding and obligatory for all of the Jewish people. Okay? So now here, conservative ideology says, okay, despite, we believe that, 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 we believe that humans were always a part of the development of Jewish law. 
And we believe that historically, Jewish law has always kind of reacted to its surroundings. That's why you can see the, 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 the Jews of Minsk doing things very differently than the, than the Jews of Troy. Because they lived in different worlds, although they knew not to eat pig, they knew not to have milk and meat together, they knew to go not to do work on Shabbat, but there were other very minhagim because humans are humans. And, and that process does not stop. That process means that each generation of scholars and rabbis have not just the right but the responsibility to reevaluate the Torah and make it a Torah, a Mayim Chaim, a Mayim Chaim, a, a, a living water that allows it to continue to speak to the Jews in every age. So, the fact that humans are partner, in partnership with God doesn't mean that we're not bound by the law. We're bound by the law because we believe that we're trying to, to we're trying to understand, we're trying to, to decipher what is God's will for us, which makes it God's will for us. We're, we also are bound to it because we are a people and we're defined and we're, we're, we're and you, the reason for the reason for being an observant Jew may, doesn't necessarily have to be because God commands or commands everything. It could be because you believe that God expects this, or, or you're part of a people that's defined, defined this as God's will, and I'm part of that people, so I feel obligated to do it. Or because I feel obligated to my ancestors, or because I feel obligated, because I believe that that is a vehicle to be a better, a better person in the world, you get the Jewish mission across in the world. There are a number of reasons to be an observant Jew. It doesn't all have to be because your imunah, your faith in the immutability of God's word is such that it's such that you don't have you don't question it. So that is that so that means that with the status of women, we go back to like I said to you, there's nothing in the Torah which says that you have to have men as part of a minion. The Gemara even says, and the, the Mishnah says that women are obligated to tefillah, just like men are. Now the reason we say, traditionally we say women are not part of the minion, don't aren't counting the minion, is because a man has a different obligation than a woman has. But the oral law is very clear, the mission is very clear. A woman has the same obligation to Dothan as a man. Right. The uh yeah, Mitzvah says she has man grandma. Alright. So that's the, that's this idea that it's a time bound mitzvah. Yeah. Or a positive time bound mitzvah, meaning, okay, morning comes, and, and women are exempt from that. On Friday night, do women light shout out candles? That's a time bound mitzvah. That's a time bound mitzvah. But, but that's Pesach, like, Pesach, Pesach right. comes, and women have to have matzah. Hanukkah comes, and women are obligated to light the Hanukkah. Purim comes, and women are obligated to hear, the, to hear the, the Megillah. There are so many exceptions to that rule that that rule is kind of. In, in outside of orthodoxy, that rule is kind of seen as um, as not a hard and fast rule, but an, a reason given to explain why women don't do certain things. But not necessarily not, not saying that it, it, it's explaining why women don't do certain things, but not why women shouldn't be doing certain things. Mm -hmm. But all of those, the lights and the candles, uh, Hanukkah candles, eating matzah. What else did you say? In matzah, uh, light in the the Megillah is the only one that you actually Megillah. have to hear it outside of the house. You have to do it outside of the house. Shofar. Shofar. You hear the shofar? By actually doubling, doubling every day. You can't, go, you, can't go, you can't go to the mikvah. And so I guess you can go to the mikvah inside the house, but, but you know, going to the mikvah once, once a month, you know. Um, I don't know. There, there's, there are. There are. It's more the in the minyan, I think, in the morning. Uh -huh. All right, so let, let me tell you. Again, I'm not the expert on the on the on the status of women, etc. But we could, but it, it's it's pretty clear if you look at the at the post scheme up until uh, the Magen Avraham, which was only about 100 years ago, where women were supposed to be dominating, and they 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 they, they, they they diluted it down to the point where they said it's, a woman just has to say any tefillah like during the day, and that covers her obligation. So she could say a psalm or something like that, and that's enough. But it's very clear. In the in the uh, in the, most of the sources, much earlier than that, that a woman was, was obligated to say the Amidah. Three times a day. Once a day. Once a day. Just like a man was once a day originally. Okay? 
But the point is, is that and that there and a woman could be a woman could be come up, come up for an aliyah, but she doesn't because of me pnei kavod tzibor. But if but they didn't say pnei koli shana ervai. It didn't say because a woman's voice is is uh, promiscuous. It just says pnei kavod tzibor. So but by the way, it's it's not the Gemara that says pnei kavod tzibor. Yeah, it does. It's not the no. It says it says no, it, it says in the Gemara it says pnei kavod tzibor. Not. No, it doesn't say, the Gomorrah doesn't say it, the Rashi says it on the Gomorrah. Uh, Yonah, do you have a... Uh, I'm have... Googling it. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's Masaka Megillah, I think it's uh, Kaf Gimel. So, um, that, that's, only, that's the only reference I know in the entire Gomorrah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's my dad says, my dad says, anyway, somebody says, how much your shirt is, you don't say, 750 in Target. You say, oh, thank you. That's right. Um, so, uh, no, I probably don't say in the Gemara. It's Tosa, it's not Rashi. No, no, no. Look in the Gemara itself, though. All right, all right. Give me a second. Take all right, all right. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying. Well, the reason why it says Tosa is, Tosa is also going to comment on me, Bnei Kabbalah Sibor, the same Dibore Matheel. Right? Rashi's going to talk about uh, about me so we're trying to give definition to that. But he's ah. he's reacting to what is me think about in Sibor. That's all it says in the Gemara. And Rashi's going to come and try to define what is that. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So now we get, let's go to reform. Reform. Uh, the theology is similar to conservative. The written oral Torah are the result of Israel's attempt to define a relationship with God. Authorship is attributed to humans who recorded Jewish history and sought to understand God's will. Okay? So, in, in this way, the Torah is kind of like a history book. Within that history book, it talks about a people that was seeking God, trying to have a relationship with something that you couldn't see, ineffable, couldn't feel, but you were kind of sure it existed. And so it tells the story of, our, of the patriarchs and the matriarchs, how we began. It tells, are the Jews at that time decided to do sacrifices, and these are the sacrifices because they wanted to worship God. These are how our ancestors were in relationship with God. And it's divine because it was our seeking out God and our, and our believing that we actually found a way to channel, or if not channel, at least communicate to God. Um, rather than it being necessarily prophecy or God speaking to any human and that human writing it down, it was more humans experiencing the world and writing down our beliefs or thoughts about what God, we expect God to be or what God expects out of us. Now we go to the ideology for Reformed Judaism. Just one very, very quick question. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> does, this, does this mean that the reforms experience a direct communication or direction with God in any way, shape, or form? If the Torah is, if the Torah is, <laughs> is solely an expression of their understanding of God and the universe, mm -hmm. then do they experience some sort of connection or partnership or communication, which? Orthodox and conservative do in their own way. I would say yes. I would. I would. I would say. I would say that. I. I would say that a reformed Jew could just as just as powerfully have a have a spiritual experience uh, with God in the Beit Knesset as uh, as anybody else. Right. No, I'm talking about. I'm talking about some sort of direct communication. Like, yes. Yes. Like yes. They're, they're, yeah. For tefillah for them. In fact, Reform Judaism has changed some traditional words of the tefillah because they only want to say things that they so, believe, but they want, they want to say it because they want to, they want to say to God in an earnest, honest uh, way with integrity. In, in a very respectful way, I want to jump in. Um, I'm, studying to be a, I'm studying to be a reform rabbi, so. Oh, good. And a future reform rabbi, yes. Um, so one of the things in my understanding of reform ideology is that there was a point when prophecy stopped. And so, by saying that, and the notion that prophecy existed as a direct vessel of God's God's voice happened. I'm, I'm struggling with with the idea of authorship as attributed to humans who recorded Jewish history. Mm -hmm. um, so let me tell you. I wonder if you can expand on that. These, all, these, these, yes. all of these. This is a sheet that I created, and I sent it out to uh, colleagues, Reform mm -hmm. colleagues, Orthodox colleagues, to get their approval. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly, I wasn't going to get uh, consistent. Gonna consistent. Right. Um, you know, let's say authorship is attributed to humans who recorded Jewish history. Mm-hmm. So let's say Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. Okay, Ezekiel had a prophecy. Right. Ezekiel wrote the book of Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. He was the author. Right. He was writing down kind of his experience mm-hmm. of God and, and the Jews in that period of time. So, so perhaps maybe there should. Um, I'm willing. I'm not wedded to this. I mean, I, no, it, no, it's no. very. It's, it's exciting to me to hear that you know that prophecy mm-hmm. um, was seen as such. Um, you know. Um, so I'm not, it could be that's a, the, we can we can add that on to the definition of what we have here. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think your definition, by the way, is like very. Spot on. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. So, for, for ideology, by the way, I said you, I opened, I opened up by saying, you know, you'll say, you hear people say, I'm a Reformed Jew. I, we did very, very little growing up. Well, there's nothing probably that upsets a Reformed oh, rabbi or a Reformed <laughs> educator more than hearing that because that has nothing to do with Reformed Judaism. Mm-hmm. Reformed Judaism is not, is not being disconnected and being secular. Reformed Judaism, the, I'll tell you this, that I didn't know it at the time, but my friends who went to Shul on Friday night who were Reformed and and when I was growing up, they were the most committed Jews I knew. Right. They were reforming the most committed Jews I knew because they were going to show once a week. Right. I went once and twice a year. So it does, Reform Judaism doesn't mean you don't know anything, or you don't do anything, or you're disconnected. Here's what Reform Judaism ideologically means. Now I told you I can be critical of all of these, and, and just because, by the way, just because these are the ideologies doesn't mean the people who fall into, who, who, consider, who define themselves in each category live according to the ideologies. Mm-hmm. Especially conservative and reform. The ritual laws of the Torah were relevant to a specific period in history and are not binding on modern day Jewry. The moral and ethical law remains relevant and is binding on all the Jewish people. That's what I mentioned earlier. Ben Adam al Khabiro is still obligatory. Reform Judaism says that Jews should be educated Jewishly and adopt whatever Jewish customs they find personally relevant. This is where, Ju- where Reform Judaism gets the, the bad rap of, oh, it's uh, pick and choose. All right? So, if there is obligation in Reform Judaism with regard to something other than Ben Adam it's a Jew is obligated to be knowledgeable and educated Jewishly, know what Shabbat is, know what Kashrut is, and then if it enhances your sense of spirituality, your connection to God, your connection to the Jewish people, your connection to Israel, then do it. But if it doesn't hold any meaning for you, you're not obligated. That's what Reform Judaism is. And so many Reformed Jews go to Shul every Shabbat, maybe may keep kosher, uh, do, do some davening regularly. I know some, it's, it, it's kind of interesting, I know many Reformed women who put on tefillin on a regular basis, much more than the men that I know. But that's also an ideological kind of statement, which is, the tradition has told me I can't put on tefillin, so the women say I'm going to put it on, and the men are saying, the tradition tells me I must put it on, and so I'm not going to put it on. That's another story which, what's your name? Michael. Which Michael, I'm sure, is happy to address. <laughs> and has to deal with it. Yes. <laughs> You're right about the Talmud. I was right about the what? I was right about the Gemara. Right 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 Thank you. Mm-hmm. Oh. Thank you. Sorry. Orly, have any second thoughts? To which region that is, please. Go on, read it. It says, Turn around and have called Orly. Uh, Minyan Shiva, the seven who are go up, go up for the Aliyah. Right. even a minor. Right. Aval, Aval. A woman will not go up to read in front of the Torah. It doesn't say a minor. A minor, yeah. No, it doesn't say a minor. A 13 year old. That's not a minor. It's below the age of Barbara. It's the issue in the question that Matthew was the minor. Yes. Yes, it's a minor. And then what does Rashi say? Well, it's in the Gemara on my sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's just. What does Rashi say? You're right, Rashi. So I don't want to go too far, too far, too far draft. Okay, um, okay. So these are the the theologies and the ideologies of the movements. Now, I'm going to give a little a little bit of a critique. Okay, and we'll let's start with Reform Judaism and we'll move up. Move up. This, I believe, is the, the Reform ideology is a very beautiful ideology. It makes a lot of sense. You have to be educated and do things from a place of education. And if they're meaningful to you, 
then do them. If not, then maybe you don't have to feel bound by it. For me, the problem is that, you know, I can read a book on Hinduism, it doesn't make me a Hindu. I can read about Shabbat, but until I'm living Shabbat, right. I'm in a community of people who are doing Shabbat, I can't know what Shabbat is. Mm -hmm. Same with Kashrut. And so there's no way of really educating our kids or even our adults about, mm -hmm. about Jewish ritual if it doesn't include being immersed in an environment where, where you're actually feeling the power of it. And it doesn't mean a Shabbaton, but it may mean you know, two, three, six months of it, possibly. Also, most, you know, despite the hard work of reform, the reform movement, it's really hard to, pass, to, to educate kids and even adults to a level where they can make a real strong informed choice. Um, going to the conservative, uh, conservative ideology, which I love. I happen to love the conservative ideology. It speaks to me very much. But I will tell you, it has been unsuccessful in passing it on to the next generation. Absolutely. It has not been, a, the, the, you do not find conservative, uh, observant conservatives today who can point to their grandfather and say, my grandfather was an cons observant conservative Jew and I'm an observant, an observant conservative Jew. Most observant conservative Jews today are either came from orthodoxy or are moving, moving from a secular lifestyle. You don't, and, and I know many rabbis whose children end up going orthodox or, or being outside the conservative world on the, on the more uh, uh, the, the left side because it's really hard to pass down maybe to, to the idea of your kids, you know, we do this, if you're not willing to say, you know, God, God is demanding this of us, God's expecting this of us, you know, that's muksa, you don't touch it because, you know, now I, I educate my children in a very traditional way. I'll say, you know, I'll say, you know, I think God expects this of me. I'll say, I don't do it because I think that God doesn't want me to, to write on Shabbat. You know, I always say I think or I believe or I think that God cares. Okay, I'm leaving room for, not, I'm not giving the certainty of, of exactly what God expects. Now, I don't know whether this is going to work with my children or not. But I, believe, I really do believe that, that one of the failures of conservative Judaism is the sense of obligation being passed on to the next generation. Um, and so that's where conservative Judaism. And what do you mean, sense of obligation? We don't pass on to the next generation the sense of obligation. Like, I've got to put on my tefillin every day. I've got to, right, the, the, sen the sense of God expects this of me. If we're willing to say, you know, humans are part of the process and of, of the organic change of, of, of law, then why should I do it? Because just because the Jews in the generation before me said I needed to do it. As opposed to saying, you know, God. Demands us to do it. I obligate you, and or even giving them like if I don't do it, you know, I need to I need to fear God, right? Um, and it's really hard to walk that line of saying you do these things in celebration of God and in in a, in a covenant relation with God. The way you're the way that I do things for my wife that I don't want to do, I would rather not do those dishes. I'd rather watch the football game. I do it because I'm in a covenant, covenant with my wife, and that's what I'm, we're expected to do for each other. Same way, I get up and I put on film in the morning because I'm obligated, not because I'm expecting to feel anything necessarily, but because it's part of my obligation. Um, and it's really hard to pass on the idea of you do it because you're in a relationship with God and this is expected of you versus you have to, you know, fearing God. Now, by the way, this idea of fearing God, the reason, despite a conservative Jews being a tamid chacham and being very observant, because there are many people like that, I'm not the Tamil Chacham, but I'm the observant part of it. The reason why Orthodox Rabbani do not, uh, and I say this, there are Orthodox Rabbani who will recognize conversions that I'm part of, who will recognize weddings that I'm part of, but on that, that's individual. On the establishment scale, they will not, is because the claim is that conservative rabbis do not have Yirat Shemaim. Yirat Shemaim has been translated as fear of God, but in fact, I say it's, it's awe of God. They say, you don't have Yerat Shemaim because you don't believe the, all, the, all the Torah was given to Moses. If you don't believe all the Torah was given to Moses, then your approach to the text is already outside the fold of what is legitimate and authentic expression of Judaism. And because of that, you do not have the authority 
to serve as a rabbi. Okay? That's just the that's just so, so you understand the ideology behind why orthodoxy, even, even though that a conservative, a conservative convert can go through the very same ritual elements and be and be very observant, the fact that it was a bait dean of conservative rabbis, not a bait dean of orthodox rabbis, can render that conversion pasol. Yes. Uh, my, the, the thing which I feel though is that this idea of Yirat Shamayim of fear of God, which I think is true in the Orthodox world, which I'm in some ways critical because I was brought up in a religious system where that fear of God was literally a fear. Right. And the fear was to do with being punished, either punished by death or, or people in your family dying, things to the point of if as, a, as a, a bit of a petty example, that if the, wor if the word, if you didn't check your mezuzot, mm -hmm. and there was something in the word lev, levavacha, in the shema, which was rubbed out, then chas v'shalom, somebody on your family may, God forbid, have a heart attack. Okay? Now, it's probably not true of all orthodoxy that it's like that, but my question is whether, whether it's that kind of fear, yes. which, is, which is artificial, is what is part of what is this passed on to the next generation? That God forbid it should happen to me. God forbid it should happen. To me. No, that's and, in, and if that's true, then the conservative world may not have that fear. That could be a good thing. Right. It could be a good thing, but it can only, in my opinion, it can only be a good thing if we can succeed in creating communities <laughs> where where people in the community are observant, and the next generation, our children are observant, and our grandchildren will be observant. And you have and to give a reason why of, to the value of observing. Well, you, that's can't, right. you can't just observe because you're defining it as creating a relationship. Well, so there has to be so, meaning so, behind right, that. So what I, so what, of course, and so part of the, what I say is, you know, every morning we give tzedakah before they go to, they go to school, and we say, you know, the money that we have in our bank account doesn't belong to us. You know, God decides who, 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 has, who has the money, but people who don't share the money with others the way they're supposed to, you know, don't deserve the money. You know, so you, well, I, I say these things, but I don't want to put, I don't want them to experience God and ritual with this sense of fear and this sense of um, uh, scare and coercion. I want them to do it because, you know, just like, just like it's just move on me a love that, that you're going to pick a partner in life that is literate and can read and write. It's just a course you're going to end up with that kind of person. Move on me love that I'm going to keep Shabbat because it's just part and parcel with who I am. That's how I define myself. But that's the real tension is: can we pass on this this sense of Yiddishkeit, which which includes uh, you know observance of Jewish law, without the the fear factor? Uh, it can be with an awe factor, not a fear factor. And I don't know. It's a, it's a real challenge. And one of the reasons I moved to Israel, by the way, is because Israel does allow for a certain generosity or lenient latitude where if my kids go on a different era, <laughs> that the chances are my grandchildren will still be Jewish. Um, by the way, I, I've written on this, I have a, I have a blog, and I've written about, about would I rather my children be Haredi or Reform? Because I'm somewhere in the middle. And it's interesting, and I ended up writing, in Israel, I'd rather my children be Reform or secular, right. and out in Chutzla Arts, I'd rather them be Haredi. Because in Haredi, in Haredi outside of Israel, I see them as trying to preserve Judaism. The Haredi in, 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 Haredi in, in Israel, I see them as building walls between, between Jews. And I think, I think it's a radically different experience. So Israel provides us with a certain security and a, a security that uh, we don't have anywhere else. Um, it allows me to be the Jew I, the Jew that feels I feel most comfortable being. By the way, if I had stayed in America, I would really, there were very few, there are very few observant conservative communities. Mm -hmm. And the ones that do exist are mostly on the outskirts of the, of the establishment of the Orthodox. Mm -hmm. Upper West Side, Pico Robertson in Los Angeles, the mikvahs, the Jewish, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the restaurants, all these are basically Orthodox and there's a conservative, there's a conservative community living within it. Rather than an organic conservative community that has its own mikvah, its own arrows, its own restaurants, its own kosher butcher, standing alone. And so I still believe that until, cons cons until, until non-orthodoxy is as 
successful passing it down to the to grandchildren's generation, I think that, I mean, I have great respect for orthodoxy because it's succeeding in a certain way. Absolutely. Um, so, and look, the orthodox, orthodox ideology, the problem with orthodox ideology is, you know, as we're seeing today, we have the Aguna issue. We have the, the everybody looking over the shoulder. Even in the orthodox world, modern orthodox are the most attacked segment of the, of the Jewish population, I think, that exists. Because you can't be modern orthodox anymore. You're all constantly looking, and the, and the, the Haredim, or the Mafdal, or the, you know, the, uh, the Haredal people are looking over your shoulder and saying, you know, are you kosher enough for us? And, and, um, and you know, how do you, how do you deal with, you know, you have, if, if we're talking about Torah study being the most, the most wonderful thing in the world that a Jew can do, how do you not allow women to engage in it? And then how do you, how do you, I have a daughter and a son. You know, how do I live with the idea that I let my son get up to go up and embrace the Torah and have the kavod of Benali of the Torah, and I, and I have to put my daughter upstairs? How do you explain that to your children? Honestly. Unless you're, and, and how do you say, Shaloh Asani Isha? You know, there's all the apologetics of it, but it comes, thank you God for not making me a slave, for not making me a goy, for not making me a woman. That actually is a very relevant thing. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Have you ever seen in public conveniences how long women have to wait? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I think God, 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 I the, the woman doesn't say, thank you God for, for not making me a man. Right. If it said, thank you God for not making me a man, we could say it's about the mitzvot. Yeah, but if we say, thank you God for making me how I am, it's almost, a, how, do, how do we explain to the boys that you are no better, than, that, that there's equality amongst you? And how do you explain to the girls, the boys aren't any better than you? If, the, if our children are saying these things. So, so. Yeah, what Tom means about the mitzvot is that, I know that that, uh, that a man, thank you God for not making me a woman, so because I get to do more mitzvot, I'm obligated right. to do more. So then why would it be about the mitzvot if we if we said no? Thank because you because me a man. because you say you say thank you God for not for making me according to your will instead of saying think of, you're not saying if you're saying to uh, say it doesn't say thank you God for making me a man. It says thank you for not making me a woman. Right. Mm -hmm. So the converse would be thank you God for not making me a man. Why don't we just have the men say, thank you God for making me a man? And the woman saying, thank you God for making me a woman. I say, thank you God, Shasani bin Salmo, thank you for making me in your image. So that I say the same thing that the woman I died with said. Maybe it's something to do with childbirth, because if you think about what women went through in childbirth and often died. Right. We can come up with many good reasons. But the problem for me is it comes in the order of, thank you for not making me a, a slave, a Gentile, and a woman. And yeah, what is it? How, what, what is it? It's like far and like mix it up all over the place. Uh, okay. All right. The problem is that all the negatives, all the things that are put in the negative, are all <coughs> negative things in Jewish in Jewish thought. So, you know, so how do we deal with this? And and I in, in you know in orthodoxy, you know, um, and this certainly isn't the way it is probably in modern orthodoxy, but chas a tragedy occurs, right? And the orthodox response is going to be, you know, it's God's will. Now, for some people. You know, you throw to me, you go, you know, God took your child, God took your child, because God has a, a purpose for that child, and God is embracing that child, and, 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 and your child served a mission on this earth, and they're done. And for some people, that's very comforting. But for some people, that is going to say, to hell with God. How could God do that? So you have to have another response for, you have to know the population you talk to. And so for some people, you have to know, you may be able to hold their hand and say, and say, you know, yes, you know, God, God, you know, maybe has a purpose for this. That person, maybe, maybe that's the kind of person who can hear that and needs to hear that. Other person has to say, has to hear you say, I can't explain this. We don't know. But where was God in this? I'm angry. <coughs> I'm upset. You're right. To, you're right to want to walk out and be an abandoned right now. Right, but much of the uh, primarily, you can accept the Nazi, but a lot of the reformers and construction, the reconstructionists in the world don't believe necessarily 
in an afterlife. They may leave that open to some degree, but I've heard rabbis directly after my grandfather passed down. Mm -hmm. So the rabbi that told me directly, he's in the ground, that's it, it's over. And my cousins jumped up to almost strangle the guy. Well, I would too. You know what I would say? You know, it's like, it's like there's a the part of the davening, reforming is taking out this, um, the part of the davening that says, Baruch the one who, the God, the one who gives life to it's, the... It's not taken the, out in the new Siddur, it's there. It's oh, in, good. It's, it's, in, it's in parentheses. Okay. Okay. And how cool is in the, in the normal text. Good. So, so that's nice to hear that it's come back. Okay. Right. So, but, if, but, but some people, even if, it, 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 even if it's in the Siddur, not some people don't want to say it. Thank you, God, for, for giving life to the dead. You know what I say? I say, I hope it's true. I'm saying, I, I, hope, I hope my grandmother my grandma is still watching me. I hope that my grandmother's fate is different than Hitler's fate. I hope that, you know, so you can say that, you know, this Nightingale just says you don't say things you don't really believe. But, you know, there's something to say, you, you say things, you pray for things that you hope to believe, that you hope that you want to get there at some point. So it's, it's inappropriate to say there is no afterlife. That guy doesn't know there's no afterlife. You know, just like it's inappropriate for, in my opinion, Anybody else to say there is an afterlife? They're you know they're in a better place. You know it, it would be, I say well let's hope they're in a better, better place. You know but to say you know there but but to say you know with certainty just like that rabbi said with certainty there's no afterlife. I think it's I think it's inappropriate to say with certainty that to say there is. You can go even more, more not even Kabbalistic, kind of and you can find <clears throat> worlds. It's, it, it's, you can, yeah, you can I understand. Research. I understand. But but again, my take on what you see in the Gemara. Like the same way, you know, the 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 the, the, um, the Agada, where Rabbi Akiva says, "What was the what was the plague of Sfardea? It was one huge giant giant Godzilla like frog." That was his that was his take on it. Okay, so are we saying that that really was, or are we saying that you know what they, they, they were, they were, they're using they're using these things as metaphors, or they're or they're just trying to engage each other in, in, in the Shakla Batara, the given the give and take. To try to say that nothing is beyond the realm of, of, of discussion, and let's as a community try to find uh, try to find something that, that we think is palatable and important and, and implementable, implementable and reasonable. So, if we're, just because it's in the Gemara doesn't mean that the conversation ends at that point, because um, uh, we're not supposed to abandon our imagination. We're not supposed to abandon our our intellect. The reason, the reason why we're supposed to be studying and constantly going over this stuff and looking for Hiroshim all the time is because we, we have, there's more things to discover. So I think, see the problem with, with the, the Shulchan Aruch, which is an incredible work, but the problem is with the Shulchan Aruch is, here we are, things were done different ways historically. All of a sudden, the 16th century, the Shulchan Aruch comes out, and all of a sudden people say, ah, this is the law. This is how it's done. And that that ossified us. That made us a like, concrete rather than rather than a, a piece of uh, you know a tree mm -hmm. that's sprouting and having different different branches. Mm -hmm. And I think that Judaism is stronger when we're organic. But that's my take on it. Uh, any other did I cover the question you wanted to ask earlier? That was more comments. Oh, okay. Comment, you want to make the comment? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was. <coughs> That um, you're talking about how the, theolo the theology was that we don't need the Benedictine Macom anymore, and um, oh, because of uh, the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to like add to it that it's it's because they felt like maybe they were thinking that at the time like monotheism didn't really exist, so it was really fight bucking the tide. You needed all of these rituals. To kind of bring monotheism, and now we get, you know, we accept monotheism, you know, as a as a given. As a given, and we have all, you know, an all this developed philosophy. So that's why we don't need the Vedanta so much anymore. Mm. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> yes. Uh, three short. I kept them all for the end because I feel like I can ask three. Um, three questions or comments? A bit of both. Um, the first question is, I'd be very interested, you, you began by talking in the, in the early 19th century, the 19th century about how they all began. At that stage, to what extent is there a difference between the conservative movement and 
something like Shimshon Rafal Hirsch's, which then became part of modern orthodoxy. Um, in, in brief, yeah. where Shimshon Raphael Hirsch um, was okay with the idea of modern, of modern uh, uh, science and learning uh, and, and modern uh, disciplines, there wasn't, he didn't have a different approach when it came to the text. In terms of the text, it came something from Moses and Mount Sinai, it's immutable, etc. Whereas the conservatives were saying, we want to conserve orthodox practice, traditional practice, but allow ourselves to, to believe or engage in the text, the, the origin of the text, the way similar to where uh, the reform were doing. The, the connection you made here, and, and it's also the connection I had when I was growing up, is that one's view on halakha and the evolution of halakha is inherently connected to the origins of the text. Um, but actually, I think one could argue, and I'd be very happy to hear your opinion on this, that on the one hand, you could believe that every single word was given by God or dictated by God, yet actually be very radical in terms of how you think halakha should develop, because you could say, God gave us the authority to change things, and on the other hand, you could actually believe that it's all made up or that it was divinely inspired or whatever, but actually be very conservative, small c, in the sense that you don't think that, the, that halakha should evolve, because you prioritize other considerations. I'm wondering if whether the connection that certainly I made growing up in anglo jury and I think a lot of people make, which is your view on halakha is determined by your view on the origin of the Torah. Maybe we need to separate those two things. It's possible. Like I said, I don't even fall into this, in the category, any of the categories on the page. So I would agree with you. Um, I, my personal theology is I believe the Chumash, the five books of Moses, was given about Moshe and Mount Sinai. But I also believe that the, that the oral law was human partnership with God's written law to develop how we are, how, who, how we're supposed to be in the world. So yes, my I still I have a very strict approach when it comes to the chumash, the written law. But I have a organic, flexible approach when it comes to the oral, and which is the development of halacha. So I would agree with that I think it'd be I think it'd be interesting to find someone who who maybe challenges the the theological underpinnings of the written word, and then is kind of be un, would not be flexible in terms of the continued development of the halakha. But yes, I agree, you, you don't, you don't, you can, you can, just because you have a certain approach to the origin doesn't mean that it doesn't, isn't a necessary correlation to your halakhic approach either. But I think you can be exceptional. Because uh, I think the rule is going to be closer to to what I present tonight. I don't want to monopolize the conversation, just one more small point. I'm fascinated by the idea of, of how you maintain the awe. Um, and I, I actually very much identified with what Danny said about a lot of uh, religious mm -hmm. Judaism as a child is based on, on fear. Mm -hmm. um, I was speaking to a few friends who were who Datlashim, mm -hmm. who were formerly religious. And what's interesting about a lot of Datlashim um, is that they often want to bring up their kids in a religious way because they, without generalizing, many people love how they were brought up and love that security of uh, there is a God and God's watching over you, even if nowadays as adults they don't necessarily believe that. Mm -hmm. I think it ties into that same question of how, do you, how does one pass on certain things even if one doesn't necessarily believe that they are objectively, scientifically true, right? As, as one uh, gets older, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's this fascinating, interesting. And I, you know, when I when I counsel uh, people, couples, um, I tell them to to raise their children with, with a belief in God, mm -hmm. because you know, I believe that it's easier to eventually. It's easy. It's, I think it's an easier process to believe in God and then start questioning. And then, and then come back to it as opposed to being raised where you never hear your parents talking about a God at all and there's a complete absence and there's very little curiosity is may, may enter a person's uh, who raised, who's, who's raised like that. I'll tell you that how I, how I maintain my constant awe of God is I really see the halacha as a way that's, that, that, that the halacha is about seeing the world 24-7 through a Jewish lens. Mm -hmm. So I walk outside on a cool morning, and I and I walk out of the sh out of the shadow, and I, the sun hits my face, and I I try to have an awareness, and I go, wow, thank you for the sun. Thank you. Just just a constant, and I say this to my kids. I say, 
we turn on the water, you know, to, to get a drink of water to make someone and I go, if there was no water, we would die. Thank you, God. You know, I'm just all I'm doing things like that. That's their language. But you know what? They're my greatest teachers. I'm saying they're asking the most incredible questions, the questions that we won't allow ourselves to ask. If my son says, Abba, if God created the world, who created God? Okay. You know, we don't want to ask that question. We want to say, thank you. You know, I say, go ask your mother. <laughs> you know, or incredible things. Where if, God, if God created everything, why did God create, you know, uh, Yigal Amir? You know, why did God create cancer? These things, we don't want to go there, right? So, but the point is, is that if we're going to accuse or be angry or question God and the, and the challenges, the tragedies, we also have to, to be fair to recognize that if we look at our hand and control which finger moves that's right. and say, that's a reminder that, okay, I'm going to be pissed off at God for the, the you know, for what you know, the tsunami, for not getting that job either, but I have to say, thank you, God, for this too. So it's a constant, it's a constant uh, tension of, or, or a constant <coughs> exercise in recognizing the little miracles that are necessary to keep us alive. Um, I just, uh, just uh, listening to you, the talk and reading this, had uh, what I thought was the sort of the uh, iPhone descriptions that, uh, you know, orthodox is, you know, Steve Jobs invented the iPhone and handed it down from Mount Cupertino. Conservative <laughs> is, well, actually, you know, Steve Jobs was, you know, involved in the design, but really it was all the Chinese engineers and, you know, it actually is manufactured in multiple places in China, it all comes together. And reform is buy a galaxy or a blackberry or whatever you like. For me, one of the questions that uh, the many, 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 many questions that goes even to why well, tonight? the reform sometimes if they decide to do three on the Ode Torah or all kinds of stuff dealing with the carbon note in the books, maybe now it's coming back. I don't know, we don't have to go to temple yet. But the question that I have under all of these different types of things is, does it work? Which you were basically saying beforehand. Are we in a process of allowing our kids to want to and know why we're about to marry Jewish? Mm -hmm. Is it important to keep it going? Or is it just because mommy said so? Because your grandparents did, you have to. But what's the reason? Well, I'll tell you, 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 you point to something in orthodoxy, you're going to see the intramarriage rate much higher, but it isn't necessarily from a place of, of education as much as a place of either, you know, this is the social club that I'm part of, or if I want to maintain my good relations with family, or, you know, out of fear of not doing it. You know, I have just, there are just as many orthodox uh, friends that I say, you know, why be Jewish? Or why marry Jewish? They can't give a really good coherent reason for that. That's a problem. And yeah, right. And um, you know, but it's just because of the, the social milieu which you're raised if you're in the traditional or orthodox world, there's a greater chance that you're gonna intramarry. And so, you know, I think the child you know, so if look, I, I tell people, if the goal is strictly to survive and to make sure Judaism is here five hundred years from now and make sure your grand your grandchildren are Jewish you know, we should go to the B'nai Barak or Meisharim. If, however, the challenge of being a Jew is actually to be an or like we and to interact and interface, we've got to be able to answer these questions for our children, and we've got to be able to send our children out there without the fe so they can be emissaries right. for God in the world mm -hmm. without being afraid of their uh, of their assimilation. Um, so, do the non-Orthodox uh, streams do that better than the Orthodox streams? No. Uh, that's a good question too. No, look, the, there, the there is question. right tonight. Right, that's a nice discussion. right. There's a, you know, I, I don't think that I don't think that any I don't think that any of the movements are doing it well. You know, if I were to put my my hat in somebody's ring, I put my hat in the, in the Orthodox uh -huh. ring. I would. Um, and like my, I'm sending my I'm, my wife and I are sending our kids to the to the religious school system because they I want them to get the traditional teaching, and at home I can we can sh we can. We can show them or model something different or have conversation with them there's something different as opposed to as opposed to giving them I want them to have a strong education as opposed to giving them a lesser education because it, because so that, so 
I spoke to him the lesser education, and then it all be, it's all on us to teach them the parts of Judaism we think are important for them to learn. I think it's important for them to know everything, and I think it's important to, to be able to discuss openly everything. Um, you know, I don't know, again, I don't know if the way we're doing it, the way we're doing it is, has a higher chance of succeeding because I'm living in Baca, where there are other families who are religious and, and, and what I call Dati Bari. Yeah. Um, I call myself Dati Bari. Um, and I'll tell, if I lived in, in some place other than Baca or something, I would be living Judaism very differently because of what I want for my grandchildren. You know, one of the questions which I was thinking about as you were going through this is that is this phenomenon of orthodox conservative reform true of other religions? Are there these kinds of groups? For example, in England, if you take a look at the political system, there's, I know it's not exactly the same, but there's conservative, there's labour, and then there's liberal, for example. So my question is whether this division within Yahad, is it really something to do with religion, Ju the, sorry, is it really something to do with the Jewish people, or is it just a phenomenon that within humankind you've got pretty much three groups of people, those on the right, those on the left, and those in the middle. And the actual ideology doesn't really matter that much. It's just this is the main way that humankind is. There are three kinds of groups of people, and they choose their own thing. It's a, gr it's a great question. I don't know. I will tell you that until uh, about 300 years ago, Judaism was not monolithic, but there was all kind of like one basket we were in because we were forced to be in that one basket. There wasn't an option. If you try to leave the basket, you're put in harem. Or it was dangerous physically because of the danger of the going in. So I can't, I don't know that, but I, mean, I, can answer you know, that question. I will tell you this. When people say to me they're angry at religion and all this stuff, or I say, look, I say, mm -hmm. religion. People will be finding words for other reasons. Yeah, blue eyes. Over, that's how humans are. There's human nature, okay. And so the question is, does you know, it's not that religion is gonna, not going to stop war? Maybe religion war is going to happen in the name of war. I mean, war will happen in the name of religion. But does religion offer a chance for taming human nature in a way that can hopefully reduce the problems? And I think it does because I think the same number of wars would be fought regardless of whether it was in God's name. It would be. It would be skin color, it would be borders, it would be wealth, Lechem it would be yeah, it would be those reasons. So I'm a believer that yes, that that that. But it's interesting, in Christianity there's like dozens and dozens and dozens. Mm -hmm. well, but Judaism, there are uh, Judaism there is too then. Yes, but Judaism yeah. is it's still the different big kinds. Degree. Look, there's kinds of Hasidut, right, 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 Reconstructionism, right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. 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 But if, to, to, in, with regard to Christianity, you can draw, you could draw a, a comparison between orthodoxy as Catholicism and Protestantism, which is broadly defined as conservative to reform, and and that that if, that the same, the exact the same issues. You know, Torah handed down from Sinai. Can you, it's very hard to believe that, but do you believe it? With, within Christianity, the belief that when you receive what's called the Eucharist, a little bit of you know wafer and the wine, that Catholics are supposed to believe that that is actually right. transformed by the priest when he says the blessing to the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. You Some that. Catholics, Protestants, not the Greek Orthodox, yeah, not the Egyptian no, Coptic. But Catholics, mm -hmm. yeah, but they're not Catholics. They're Greek Orthodox. But Protestants, one of the changes of the Protestant Reformation was to say, no, that doesn't really make sense. That's, there's just, you know, a spiritual thing on it. So it's exactly the same sort of thing. And, you know, with the text also, as we alluded to before, the Catholics, um, origin, you know, uh, wanted to sort of take the text in their sort of very traditional method. And the Protestants wanted to, you know, to get the people to look at the text and examine the text, which was, you know, that's where, in fact, as you said, reform got that emphasis from. So, in that sense, there is though, though some of those same intellectual things certainly happen in Christianity. Although today, you wouldn't say that there's it, the differences between Catholicism and Protestantism don't look the same. You can say same about in a way modern orthodoxy and conservative. Same thing. Yes, that's the boundaries true. Yes, of love. Yes, thank yes. you very much. I want to thank our hosts. Yes. Thank you guys. Thank you. Now. Which one did we do? <laughs> 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 non judgmental. <laughs>
צער בעלי חיים, לימוד, please take and pass on. All the orthodox people say, שטויה. All the orthodox people say, שטויה.